when you're composing, do you actually use words at all for yourself, or is it just a matter of notes on a piece of paper and, and just what sounds can do? Do you actually use concepts at all, or is it just com completely in the sound, dealing with the sounds, or is it nothing like I, I, either of those things? Well, the, the short answer is that um, I, I write in shapes, not, in, not with, in a sense, and texture, mm -hmm. and volume, and all the parameters. Um, I, uh, it is my understanding of dealing with these things, like uh, dynamic, for instance. Um, I, I, in, in essence, it's, it, it's what keeps me awake at night. Um, I can't say that it interests me in that sense because I really like sleeping. <laughs> and um, but um, so the the internal thing, if you in, if I if I can articulate, is the, the the question of these abstract concepts, and they carry me forward into the night. Mm. And um, but the problem with them. Uh, is that they never resolved, but I would never, as it were, write would 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 write it, take a shape and write it, write it down. It's purely something. It, it it's. I mean, my shapes generally are pretty um, cubist, mm -hmm. and that there are very rarely any bridge passages in my music. Um, in the sense that my abstraction um, is that, that there are journeys within the, the cube and, um, and there are ramifications about why something comes next. You find this is very difficult for me to talk about, I've never talked about it before. Um, so the whole concept of bridge passages in fact, that maybe all my pieces are bridge passages to something that is not resolved. Mm -hmm. It's not moving anywhere. It gets to a, it gets to a point, and then and then you begin with another cube. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, I've just been listening to my uh, Earth dances, which they're doing tomorrow night. And that's a series of very large cubes. And, and it, it, I'm sort of fascinated by hearing pieces that I haven't heard for a while, um, in, a, in a sense. First of all, my, I consider all my music is full of errors. Um, um, and I don't feel that I've written a note that if I thought about it, I could write a better one. Um, um, but you, 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 you have to resolve these things and make a truce with an idea. Um, I have amazing ideas and um, if I could realize, you know, sort of, I don't know how many percentage, I'd be the greatest composer who ever lived. <laughs> Do you want me to go on? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, well uh, I mean, it, one, one thing that, taking Earth Dances, yeah. um, that I would be very, very terrified of trying to write that piece because I think it's very difficult, unless you're you, to know actually why what does happen next does. You know, it, uh, when I hear it, I understand it, but I don't understand it outside of that. I can't, I can't imagine how you made a plan of it for example, because it sounds very spontaneous. Plans, I have an anecdote, um, and I pro I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, and so forgive me if most, some of you might know my anecdote about it. But um, in my formative years as a composer, which I suppose by the time I was sort of 25, I, um, something like that, I was not one of these um, 
uh, imagos. There's a lot of uh, imagos. I think he's probably one of them. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not. It's, this is not a. Uh, this is not, I'm, uh, you, know, you, you understand what I mean by an imago? Is a, is a is a, a creature that come, a butterfly comes into the world fully uh, as a full insect. There are no ba- <laughs> there are no baby butterflies that grow uh, into bigger butterflies. They become. They're sort of. They're there. Yeah. Can we talk about that? You probably don't agree with me. But. Well, I know, no, but at the same time, uh, is that, since you were talking about your earlier days, uh, is yeah. that, let's say, if we were, con- see, he's no longer with us, but if we were to compare you to Max Davies, would you feel that, you know, he was in a way an imago in the sense that you're talking about somebody who emerged very suddenly in a way? Yeah, and, and um, to come back to what I was talking hmm. about before, I had ideas about music in my head um, without the, 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 the method or without the thing of knowing how to do it. Mm. Um, and they were much bigger than, than my ideas were bigger, and maybe they always are, um, much bigger um, than the talent I had to resolve them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and I always imagined now this is, I, I've got to be careful about being pretentious, um, but I always imagine a music that didn't exist yeah. in a funny sort of way. And, uh, and, 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 but nevertheless, for what it's worth, these, these sort of things that I had in my head as about, about this music are still there. Um, and... Um, but it doesn't mean that the it doesn't mean that they're all that there is no development within it. It's um, it's a it's 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 a question, and uh, also uh, this uh, uh, comes back to something else. Um, this question of uh, 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 of something which is bridge a bridge passage. Um, the bridge passage is something which is always moving towards something. Um, and you've got to be a tonal composer, really, to realise these things. But um, so my ideas are absolutely, if I can conceptualise it, are circular rather than than linear. Um, but one of the essential, uh, fundamental things about music that it exists in time. And it's the dealing with this t- time that has always been at the back of my, uh, um, somewhere, uh, what I, I use the word realize, um, one, one of my dreams, if you like, or something, in, in order to deal with, with these abstract things. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm fumbling now, but I'm, I'm trying to be honest and... Um, uh, uh, so I better have another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we just briefly talk a bit of history? Uh, one of the strange things in British musical history is I don't know, somebody can contradict me, of another group of composers that's been anything like so persistently prominent as what is called, for better or worse, the Manchester group or the Manchester school or whatever, um, in Germany and France, such groups come and go, it seems to me, every five years there's another one I hadn't heard of. But um, in Britain, that's not... Composers generally are quite loners, actually, and and don't hunt in packs. Um, Even though you're all clearly very, very individual figures and and totally different. Can you... I mean, is there any reason why three such different composers should have come together at that time in the early 50s and... It's a simple answer. To, yeah. Uh, um, geographical. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, uh, and we were kindred spirits and, and, and we had the arrogance of youth about us and um, we were the only ones. Mm. Um, and in a particular time of history 
it, um, which was after the, after the uh, Second World War, um, a lot of things had been in abeyance. Mm -hmm. And, um, and s s so it was these, these things that had been in abeyance that we were born into. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was pretty interesting that, that um, I would hate to be a composer today of a young person I, um, because the, the, the journey that, uh, nothing to do with the sort of music that we've written, but, but it, it seemed to be very clear, you know, what we, where we were pointing, what the direction was. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, nobody wanted to hear it, but um, that didn't matter so much. And, um, and it was a time when the, the music was... Um, I was educated through, of music through the third programme. I mean, the third programme. And I heard, heard music and, and I honestly didn't know the difference between Hindemith and Schoenberg or... Um, they were names in penguin classics, mm. penguin books on music. Uh, and um, this is interesting. Yes. Well, um, you see, I was a clarinetist. And as a clarinetist, I was fairly good. Um, not good enough, thank God. Um, because then I, if I, my, I was always going to be uh, in the Halley Orchestra, I was being, and, um, and that didn't become, that, thank God, didn't happen. I, one day I got my instruments and gave them away. And um, so I, I got that part of me out of, out of my system. But the thing is that I played a lot of classical music. And classical music has been something that, as, as I've recently discovered in the last probably 15, 20 years, um, because I, 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 I got it absolutely out of my, um, the, the front of my, here, the music, um, um, I didn't listen to music at all. Mm. I still don't, in fact. Um, uh, and, um, but in re-listening to music, classical music, um, because of what I've been doing for the last 30 years before that time, I found that coming back to it, because of what I'm doing, I, I, it has been reinvented for me. And I re really am lis listening to a lot of classical music now in very innocent ears. Like um, as if for the first time? Or? Just like for the first time. Mm -hmm. Because I t you know, uh, cause when you're a, 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 a... Well, for me, I can't answer it. People who play, who play in orchestras... Um, we played the music and thought that was pretty good and that, 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 that. But in, in, in the way that I've, I listen to music now, I think that it, I can sort of, Schumann is something that I've, uh, as it really discovered because people didn't play Schumann at one time, particularly in orchestras, because they said he didn't, he couldn't, he didn't orchestrate very well or, what, or that sort of thing. Or something like Beethoven. Now, Beethoven I find particularly interesting um, uh, because in, to compare or to, or to make a parallel with what sort of things that I get into in music, Beethoven never does what you think he's going to do. And it seems to me, is that the essence of great music? And, and, and he gets himself, in, in a sense, into corners. 
And you think, how the hell is he going to get out of that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, it is, and that, find, that aspect of Beethoven particularly, um, I find very interesting. And how you get out, um, and something like I, I feel that um, I became very conscious about in, in the whole uh, aspect of repetition. A repetition for me is something which fascinated me and um, and in a lot of modern music that I heard uh, over the years it, it doesn't exist at all I mean repetition that you can actually that you can actually hear and the question about repetition is how you Device methods of getting out of the repetition. Why? I don't know whether. Can you tell me what I'm trying to articulate? Because I. Well, look, the other day I, I had a student and we were looking at your Silvery Air. Yeah. And one of the things that we were both very hooked on was the fact that the music keeps telling you it's going at one speed and then immediately it goes at a different one, but not just any old different one. It's the fact that the, the, you're given a very clear amount of information and then it, you push it somewhere and you can hear, it's almost as if I can hear what you're doing to the sound each time you, do, you make a move. Yeah. I find that very exciting. And I think the repetition's absolutely a, a core part of that. Um, but then, uh, yeah. I'm getting stuck, <laughs> um, as Beethoven might get out of it. You've got, you've got him to a it. corner. Yeah. But I mean, when you started doing the repetition thing, which presumably would be with Trigoidia, well, or even earlier? I don't know. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, uh, um, uh, and I can't remember. Uh, and I don't know how to... Hmm. I mean, it must have been quite a, quite a daring thing to do. Well, no, it seemed an exciting thing to do, yeah. thrilling, yeah. you know. I, I, I just think... Um, and one thing that I discovered at one point... Well, if, if you probably... Right. Um, I got to... I, I'm very interested in the, in the visual arts. Um, particularly painting. Um, I, I'm interested in that because um, I feel that I have more in common. Usually when people write about music, it's immediately crotchets and quavers. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, how many, how many books have been written about music which is actually... Um, uh, in, to compared with certain books about, about um, the visual arts. And um, because the, the thing is in the visual arts, they're never technical. They're all about how you, how you, resolve, the, how you resolve the problems. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether any of you know the, the uh, work of Philip Guston. Now, I mean, I find it extraordinary, his understanding and battling with the sort of the ideas uh, of, uh, of, of, of what he does. And, uh, and then along came, comes a, a figure like Morton Feldman, who I very well know. And then it turned out that Morton was a particular friend of Philip Guston. And, uh, and, uh, and Morty had a very big influence on me as a composer. I didn't want to write music like Morty, mm -hmm. but his understanding about what the what the business was, about um, uh, about one's responsibility um, to, to to your ideas, um, has meant more to me than 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 any anything anybody else. I mean, it's the it's the nearest thing I've had to a composition teacher. I mean, and also he works with repetition in different ways too. Yeah, in a very different, very way. different, in way. a very different yeah, way. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in a sense, it's all repetition. So consequently, it is nothing. Mm. Nothing's repeating mm. in, a, mm. in, a, in a way. Yeah. 
But uh, what I was coming to about uh, about the thing, I I got on uh, onto the um, uh, onto the work of Paul Clay, and Clay in the Bauhaus um, was finding a way of teaching, a sort of creative teaching. And and so what he did is that he. He found a way of absolutely understanding the nature and, and understanding of what he had um, in order to teach it. Mm. And this, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what he was doing, in my understanding, was that he, he, he was sort of inventing, he was inventing line and that as if it had never existed. If you went, if you went to, uh, you know, the whole way of thinking about line and form and this to come back to really what I was talking about at the beginning, mm. but it was systematized in a way. And, uh, and, and then I, I, I found ways of, of understanding what I, what, what, um, uh, understanding about what the nature, I mean, he wrote, he wrote a book called The Nature of Nature, but the nature of the material that I had. And, um, and it, so that, it, it doesn't mean that I'm trying to write music called a twittering machine. Or, yeah. You know, I I'm, I'm it, but he, and, and so that it meant it meant that I I found a way in into looking uh, as if I'm looking at my material through a through a telescope, and um, and when I uh, w when the whole question of serialism came up, did you ever try writing? Well, I'm going to tell you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole question of serialism. That uh, I tried, and I could never write, find a chord that I thought I would want to put in a composition. No matter how I manipulated um, my pitches through serialism, but if I sat at the piano, <coughs> like Morty Feldman, which I suspect he did, but I'm sure he did. I could play chords that I thought were, what you, you for lack of a better word, beautiful, mm -hmm. not good, well, you know, or I've, I've not never meant that money, but I have certain qualities within them um, that I will sort of buy. I sort of, you know, I'll have some of that. And through someone like Paul Clay, um, I could then subject, as it were, I could use the metaphor of a, of a chord, I could, I could analyze a chord that I'd, through my intuition, mm -hmm. I could then analyze it as it were through a microscope mm -hmm. and, and finding words, uh, methods, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, to make more of it. Mm -hmm. Make, you know, if, if I was, if I was making sculpting a tree with leaves, every leaf would be a diff, would be the same. Uh, uh, an acorn leaf. We know what an acorn leaf is. It's, it's this got the serrated edge. But when you look at the when you look at the the, the leaves of an acorn tree, there are not two alike. Mm -hmm that everyone is different. Now, it was, it's this sort of way of, I, I, I could begin to be identify these things. Um, I use, I don't compose acorns, uh, oak trees, but um, I, I, it, it, I'm, it's simply a, a metaphor for the idea of a, how you how you proliferate material? Mm. Yeah. Um, when you compose, is the physicality in that sense of being able to find things like that, you know, important trigger? 
Yes, but don't t don't don't um, don't ask me why I like them. I mean, right. likes a bad word. It's like vanilla ice cream. I like vanilla ice cream and not chocolate ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, um, and also, it's not a simple thing. And 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 then the other side of it is that I I, I found that I always um, thought. Um, when I was in Princeton, they're talking about um, um, combinatoriality in 12 tone sets. They would always talk about the pitch, you know, yeah, yeah. but they would never talk about the interval between the pitches. Now, to me, the interval between the pitches is more, in, is more characteristic than the pitch itself. And hence, you know, the, the whole thing of modality, mm. that modes have a very particular flavor. Mm. Um, and why, why does Hebrew music sound Hebrew? Mm. Why does Scottish music, why does... And it, it's to do, in essence, it's about the, the, uh, the, inter, the, the interval. So then... I started, in, uh, started analyzing intervals rather than pitches. And this, so, and, and, but it all comes out of this way of thinking from, from Paul Clay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, were, was there, apart from later, Feldman obviously was, was a, a friend and somebody whose thought was, was exciting to you, was there, uh, was there anyone earlier, I mean, like early 20th century early, I mean, the piece that comes up sometimes in connection with you, but I've never heard you talk about it, is um, Stravinsky's Agon, which I think was important to you at some stage. No, the most important piece of mine but from Stravinsky, which is, might be in, in relation to what I've been talking about, yeah. was the Symphonies for Wind Instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I've, that you could write that you could write blocks of music, mm -hmm. um, which were like sort of bricks mm -hmm. and different musics and juxtaposed to musics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and it's the only piece really that he, he does that mm -hmm. thing. And, um, and I, but Agon, I like, I, I, Agon is for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I love the formality. I love the the, the idea of, of of what the dance is within it, mm -hmm. of the uh, the the abstract dance mm -hmm. that it's. Um, so that that, that and then funnily enough, and it's just a difficult one. This, I think in Messiaen, he interested me a lot. I mean, there are. So there's a lot of messianity I find very difficult to deal with. But then there, there is another, there's nothing, there's something beneath the surface and the, and the way that is, is quite radical. In fact, it's a sort of, in essence, it's a, it's a music, it's the only music that's like that. I mean, it's completely original in a sense. Um, but we all know what we dislike in it, don't we? <laughs> but um, but I love the I love the obsession as well in Messiaen, and um, and this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And particularly in a piece, say like Chronochromy or yeah. something. Chronochromy is a wonderful piece. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And also the 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 big the big organ pieces, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the big thundering pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I played, I think, the first performance in England of the quartet for the end of time. Oh, really? I think so. Wow. But I, I, there's no indication. I'd like to think that I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that gave you the, what I think of as the best movement in the piece. Well, the clarinet. Yeah. Did, yes, yes. Which is just incredible, yeah, really. Yeah. Oh, the, I think the un, I think that the oh the unison one. I love the unison one too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that in Manchester? Or? Sorry. Was that in Manchester? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, dare I say this? This is a confession. I borrowed it 
from the Henry Watson Music Library. You never returned <laughs> it. I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to ask for it back now. <laughs> I don't know if they even have a music library there anymore. I think the Henry Watson Library is still there. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I'll give it them back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that must have offered also some ways of thinking about stuff that other than the... I mean, the English music of, of, that you grew up with, or that was around then... Vaughan Williams. Yeah. Do, is, is it like total repulsion on your part, or what? I get the feeling it's more complicated than that. Or it's very complicated for me. Um, they're playing his first symphony tomorrow night. Um, I think I played the bass clarinet in that, but then I think there isn't a bass clarinet, so, <laughs> in, 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 so I don't know whether I did or not, but I, I, I remember. Yeah, I'm sure I did. Um, but you, you actually met him? Unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, I was taken to him with, with short pants. <laughs> and and I, I went to the, the... God, it was dark, wasn't it? The White Gates in Dorking. Uh -huh. Not Dorking. Is it was, or something? I think it was Dorking. It was yeah. Dorking, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I remember he... He came to the door, and I just read Wind in the Willows. And I remember the... the it, 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 do, you remember, do you remember Wind in the Willows? Just, yeah. When he, he comes to the door in the snow, because he's... Mm. he's I think it's, it's the mole mm -hmm. has tripped over the door and cut his foot. Mm. And he, he knocks on the door, and, and the, the, uh, the, the badger comes to the door and it's sort of suggesting that it, it's hibernation, you know, yeah. that he's, he's all sleepy and he comes in his nightshirt and mm -hmm. carpet slippers and, and opens the door. Yeah. And it was a little, it was a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a letter from him anyway. Did he look at your music at that time? Yes. I wrote a, I wrote a piece called Spring Song. Yeah. And um, he, I was sitting there and he was sitting here and he was opened it up like that and he pointed to things and when I stood up, he said, sit down, boy. <laughs> 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 What's this, he would say, and I stood up and he said, sit down. <laughs> The only, um, <laughs> did it go on like that? Yeah. Can um, I have a drink of yeah, water? Yeah, please. Um, Think of something else to ask. Well, no, well, I just want to say that the, uh, the only early piece of yours that, as far as I know, has been released on record is a piece, correct the title if I get it wrong, but called A Cooing Bird, I think. Yeah, that was my Vaughan Williams. Time. But it really doesn't sound like Vaughan Williams to oh, me. No, it really like sounds that. like you to me already. Well, that, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's very much of a system piece. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it, it drip, one hand drifts away. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it already sounds like a piece where you're trying to do something which is not you know, like British music at that time, it's trying to work out a world, to discover well, a world. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I mean, when I talk about what I think I'm doing, mm -hmm. I have no idea really, in a mm -hmm. funny way, if I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And um, in that sense, to be systematized, mm -hmm. apart from these things that I talk about, sort of slightly technical things to do with construction. But maybe, maybe that is composition. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, 
but those are not those are things I think from what you've said that you would use for this passage or something but it's not a method no I have methods but they're private methods yeah mm. you draw um, for do you, I mean because you've got a son who's an artist and you're very alert to visual arts do you actually draw per se at all do you draw as a hobby at all or anything like that not really um, I do yes I do but it's not for public consumption it's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. I have no pretensions mm -hmm. that we do it I do it for a very specific reason mm -hmm. of understanding of what proportions are mm -hmm. through the eye mm -hmm. you know I, I will draw that mm -hmm. uh, uh, obsessively mm -hmm. in order to understand the this the question of distance mm -hmm. i mean everything is a everything for me is a picture mm -hmm. you know whatever i look at it, mm -hmm. everything is a picture but, but the whole question of of time in in my pieces about how one thing comes after another and how I, how music speaks, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of music now, uh, well, um, apart from some rather obvious music, um, dangerous, dangerous thing. It, it, I always thought that a lot of things in serial music in the sense that the notes were, were, were new, mm -hmm. but the journey was, was not new. Well, I've noticed a lot of serial music has climaxes in a kind of, you know, working up and down kind of way. It actually sounds quite traditional a lot of the time in that way. Yeah, but, um, but the, the, the sort of intuition about the logic of, of what comes next. Mm -hmm. I like to have my cake and eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so there are very formal things and there are things which that I get rid of and things which I contradict and um, so so then it when it comes back to my my metaphor of Beethoven mm -hmm. or or Schumann for instance mm -hmm. Schumann it, for me is is something I really discovered probably with a sort of a slightly more refined ear than when I was a student, um, is an extraordinary composer. Don't ask me why, I mm -hmm. don't know, but I, I yeah. Um, I, one thing that you've not done a lot of lately, but at one stage you were quite involved, especially, I suppose, the early 70s, uh, in electronics, or at least you, you had some association with Zinoviev studio and all mm. that. Um, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that your music did change around then in one respect, because there's one piece, The Triumph of Time, which has just a simply, it's just much more expansive than anything else you'd written until then. Yeah, Are the two connected? Yeah, very obvious. Well, very, yeah. Uh, the thing is that very simply, I heard a piece of music played two times as slow. Oh, slower, yeah. Just an ordinary piece of music with mm -hmm. the thing. Go, oh, I thing. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but what I was interested in was the fact that how long you could play something before it gets boring. Mm -hmm. hmm? Mm -hmm. That that the whole question of tempi. Um, um, and, this, and the, the thing of listening to that music, which was, um, which was slowed down, was exactly what, it, what, mm -hmm. from a from a recording, mm -hmm. a slowed down recording, mm -hmm. to s sort of listen to it and um, and how much information you could have mm -hmm. in such a slow piece. Um, and that was quite interesting for me. Because then the, the I mean your first opera is a, is a fairly compact work 
uh, the, the second opera is, is proportionately on a very, very much bigger mm. time scale and also d changes speed a lot um, and has much more expense. Was that also culminating from things that you'd found in Triumph of Time or whatever? Because, I, 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 by the way, I have some feeling in listening to Triumph of Time that it's connected with Orpheus, the Mask of Orpheus, as a project in some way or other. Is that, is that misleading too? Well, I don't know. Difficult. Mm. Is it too long ago to... No, it's yeah. not. No, it's not. Mm. Um, I mean, I ask about Orpheus because it's, it's, I think, for many people, still one of the totally key pieces in your output. It's certainly the biggest, I think. Yeah. And um, it, the way you talk about working suggests com small scale, in a way, and yet you've managed to have these very, very big... Um, that really is, you know, a substantial piece, and I gather it's longer than, than, than it's recorded, in yes, fact. Yes, it is, yes. You know? So, I mean, I'm just interested to know how it's possible to create a piece on that time scale um, without, as it were, seizing up. Well, you keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, Does the libretto help? Yes, of course, the libretto helps. Mm. Um, but I... But if, if you've ever crossed the desert, mm. which I've done a bit of that, in, or walking, I mean, that, mm. writing long pieces. Um, but, um, well, it, 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 I gave over, I gave it up, you know. Really? For many years, yeah. Why was that? Well, I said that it was going to be done on television first, Right. Then it moved to somewhere else, and then it moved to Glyndebourne, and oh, really? then, it, then it, it, yeah, and then it ended up in a sawn-off version at at, um, at the E and O. Mm. So I said at one point um, when I hadn't, when there was no production, mm. um, I said I will only finish it if somebody is. Uh, yeah. Then I came back to it. I don't know how many years it was. Mm -hmm. I had this huge pile of stuff, paper, and sketches, and I don't know what. And going into the room where they were, it was like looking at the tomb of Tutankhamun. <laughs> what? That must have been terrifying. Yeah, I mean, like like sort of discovering something that. Um, and then, you, then I tried to sort of find mm. and, uh, and join it up, and it changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. it's, you'll, you, you'll find suddenly it's something else. The libretto has been published, um, and one thing that struck me was that certainly in Act Two, maybe in the other Acts Two, I can't remember, the libretto specifies timing to the second. Yeah. Did you go with that? No. <laughs> it, it Thank was, you. It was aromatically a, a, a thing to do with a concept of um, uh, superstructure, which was not invented by me. Mm -hmm. I uh, just went along with it. Mm -hmm. and, and so that you have to keep going, you see. So that's, yeah, that's part of keeping going. Yeah. I don't think many librettos can have been on the surface so prescriptive to a composer. <laughs> no, well. Did you, do, you, do you like librettos to be that specific? Or do you like to, to be well, able to no, change? Well, that, no, that, 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 it, 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 it would have to be that. Mm -hmm. It can't, it, it's a piece that has to, has to have that mm -hmm. um, discipline, if you like. Sort of formal quality. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Gawain is certainly very, very different. Yes, more conventional. You think? Yeah, mm -hmm. conceptually. Certainly. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Is it more like just telling a story, if, uh, in a way, would you say? Yeah. But now, do you plan to do more large scale operas? No, short scale. Mm. I want to write an opera. Um, uh, 
book about Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that a funny idea? <laughs> what? <Well, laughs> I it's quite an interesting idea, don't you? Yeah. Hmm? A sort of like Janacek. Yeah. Now Janacek's rather good. Yeah. <laughs> He's a good model. The, many of the operas have very familiar topics. Yeah, because when telling a myth, tell a known myth. Right. So you know what's going on, simply. And, um, do you think it allows you more freedom to do things with it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And the, uh, you know that um, when I wrote The Mask of Orpheus, it was it was going to be Faust, because I wanted a subject matter that had many dimensions mm -hmm. and m many expressions. And um, do you remember John Tooley? John, yes. John Tooley at, at Covent Garden? And um, who else was it there? Colin Davis? Colin Davis, right. Anyway, we had a meeting with all the, around this big table. And, um, and I, the whole question of Faust had been going on for quite a while and everybody had folders, you know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and, uh, and I was, then I had to, I had to go along and, uh, and tell them how, how, give them an update about how things, what was happening. So we sat around this table and they started on about, about the, 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 about the libretto and the da da what's going to happen. And um, I said, could I just, in, um, there's one, one thing I should tell you. I've changed the subject matter. <laughs> I said, but never mind, it's the same opera. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I thought, you see, that Orpheus was an in it was more interesting because there, it's richer in a, in a way. It's more to do, it's more, it's more me in the, that I was interested in the whole nature of music in an opera. That the, the whole, that the, the music was the thing that motivated the piece. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, well, they took it. And um, well, they didn't perform it because it was at Covent Garden, and uh, it didn't happen. That was that's that was another time it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I have the impression on listening to uh, your music that I'm entering a, f a world that I've never encountered before. I'm always very, very struck by that world. But the f the first time I hear a piece, it's as if I have to learn the language. The next time. One, one sees much, much further. Mm. Do you, and there's no reason a composer should, but do you, do you compose at all thinking, well, look, let's say 10, t the, I don't know, five times in, they'll get this bit. They may not get it at once. Or do you just simply think, whatever, this is how it's got to be? Because I think the music does work with perception. I think you do work with the Well, with it the seems listener. absolutely obvious to me when I do it. Mm -hmm. It seems the most, uh, or uh, there's, a sort of, there's a sort of contradiction in my in my way of thinking, mm -hmm. and it and and it's something that, given the time, I could talk. Maybe I could talk. This is informality, but um, uh, uh, about how uh, how the journey of a piece of music. Uh, um, I mean, the various things, I mean, in the end, we're free of tonality, mm -hmm. if you wish to think of it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, um, I think serialism has, has freed us from, in, in, a, in a sense, a Mahler symphony that lasts Christ knows how long. Um, in a sense, it's the, it's the same it's the same journey as it's a tonal journey, mm -hmm. 
and, um, uh, and the originality is, is within it. But I think that maybe my way of thinking of things that, that my actual journeys are not, are not tonal. Um, I can contradict myself. Mm -hmm. And um, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and to do things, and also the idea of something which is in, 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 in a piece which is in a permanent state of exposition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I hear that. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, it, 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 it's not going through territory, it's going round. Mm -hmm. It, it's a static concept and um, I don't, but apart from that I don't know. Do you generally start at page one? Yes. Always? Yeah. Always. <laughs> because? Is it context? Yeah, it's the context. You know, because the, 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 if I like it, it's the journey that's interesting. Mm -hmm. When, in, in my 20s and da, 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 um, something like that, you know, Stockhausen's writing form schemes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, and a, a lot of people were writing form schemes. And what it did is, they, they, were, they were musical architects. They did. They they got it all sort of, you know, and I wrote form schemes, and and I remember putting. I had a I, I, I well, I've had several circular um, studios, and write these form schemes, which go around the wall. And I start at the beginning with whatever my form scheme was. And after two days and 18 inches, <laughs> what I, boredom. <laughs> uh, uh, because as soon as you have a context, there are the possibilities of how you move forward um, are, are much more interesting than anything you could pre-compose. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so this idea of the journey, the originality of the journey, the, the logic, it, and it sends up things which you, in the scheme of doing something abstract mm. or, or unrealized or something is in an anathema to me, I, I, yeah. Mm. So consequently my pieces, a lot of my pieces last about half an hour in a single movement. Yes, that is, that's your time, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I'm never surprised about what I write in the, in the, uh, the detail. You know, it's just striking. But there are certain juxtapositions and there are certain things of accidents which send me forward. And... Um, uh, and usually a half an hour seems about right, yeah. But I'm never, I'm never, I'm more interested, I'm, I'm surprised with how the music speaks in time, yeah, what, what the journey of the piece is, more, um, yeah, than the detail of a, a lot of funny noises. I don't write funny noises. No. Do you, do you ever, um forget about pieces once you finish them? Do you have a need to sort of just pull yourself out, away from them? No. I, well, what, uh, time. I'm of an age of, of knowing, understanding what the distance of time is. Mm -hmm. And um, I was taken back um, to a place where I was where I lived with my parents and and there was a cupboard with a I, I must have it, it must it must have been about well I was born in 1934 I, 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 I think and I was definitely living there when I was seven but not much later and the familiarity of this cupboard mm -hmm. 
and its patina mm -hmm. and its uh, and this knob mm -hmm. it was as if it was just like well it's a bit Proustian in fact mm -hmm. in, in, a, in, in a way um, and I I always think I always think it's about dogs that they have no concept of time mm. you know they they uh, if you leave them for three days or two hours mm. it's it's it's, you know, it's more or less the same. Most more or less, or less the same yeah. thing. Um. Um, they took, uh, there's a film, BBC film, about Xenarchis, and they took him back to his school when he was a kid. And um, very much something like what you just said, mm -hmm. he was very startled because it hadn't changed. No. But, I mean, he'd lost half his face and had a whole life since then. Yeah, my son was thinking about buying a cottage in which I, which we, which we lived in. Um, and that's probably 25 years ago, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And um, so I hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. And the banister, mm -hmm. I ran my, I automatically put my hand down the banister. I knew mm -hmm. That there was a crack in it. It was, it, it, it was, it was sort of halfway down where the wood had joined, mm -hmm. and it was as if I hadn't. It was absolutely familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the lady starts saying that she saw the Mask of Orpheus, Gawain, and the Minotaur. Do you have, as the composer of those pieces, ideas about staging, and what was your experience? of staging for those pieces oh, and, and things generally of that sort. They did, a couple of years ago, they did Gawain in Salzburg. And they had um, switched the role of, uh, of Gawain into Joseph Boyce. Oh, good God. And, and it was the most terrifying thing. I mean, a stupid, I mean, I'm still suffering. <laughs> well, yeah. What? I, yeah. I'm still suffering. I mean, it was r ridiculous. Um, I mean, and one thing they, they said, oh, well, you know, that we're making it up to date and, and it's relevant to, it's relevant to us now. Well, first of all, Gawain is a fairy tale, for God's sake. You know, you don't understand that. And secondly, I happen to know about Joseph Boyce, but I don't think everybody knew that he always wore a hat and he, he always wore these things which had a lot of pockets mm -hmm. and, and that he wrapped himself in, uh, in felt and, and put... Um, uh, because his aeroplane landed somewhere in the Arctic Circle. So he took the grease from the, from the aeroplane and rubbed it on his body. And Nothing to do with Gawain at all? I, no, nothing. nothing and not as interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I spent nine months, at least nine months, writing a section in it called Gawain's Journey. Now you couldn't, if you wanted from now to the end of time, you will never find a better place to do this journey because in Salzburg, which is in, it, it has, do you know, have you been there? No, never. Well, no. It, it's, it, it's got this rock face. It's, as, it's longer than this room. That's the stage. Oh, good God. Natural, Natural, Real rock face? Yeah, it's a proper rock face. And um, you'll never find anywhere better to do that. In order to, I don't know whether you know what Joseph Boyce did, but one of his things, he had a, a VW van mm -hmm. um, and he stacked it with, um, with sledges, toboggans, mm -hmm. you know, packed in the back. And then he took them down a, a staircase, one after the other. Yeah, and when he got to the bottom, he sat. He, he sat. He sat in it, and that was Gawain's journey. 
Now, you know, I wanted to make this wonderful, this wonderful horse. Mm. Mm. And, you know, he's going, and he goes through, I don't want to go on about it anymore. Right? <laughs> well, the, the horse in the first, I mean, in the first production, the, yeah. the horse was crucial. Yeah. I mean, the pantomime. Yeah, but the possibility yeah. of what mm. was possible with the whole idea of a journey. Mm. Mm. It, Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, do, do we ask about other productions, or should we leave that? No, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. Okay. <laughs> as far as I understand it, the question was asking: Is there any connection with, or how do you derive m meaning, whatever that? Well, that's a contentious question, of course. Uh, from the building box of which your music's made. Perhaps another way of saying this, uh, I don't know, might be. How do you know what the music's saying? Or is it saying? I've no idea what it's saying. No, seriously, I, I've no idea. And when I talk about the building blocks, my building blocks, when I did use the metaphor of the, this is uh, of the oak leaf or whatever mm -hmm. metaphor you want to use, are only the means, are, are, it's not telling you when you take the chisel mm -hmm. to the thing, what you're going to make out of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you write an opera, must you not, to some extent, be in control of what it's well, meaning? Well, you have the narrative then, don't yes. you? That's one thing you can keep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then you start making connections. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's, it's just the same thing of writing. It's a longer piece. Mm. Yeah. See, the problem with music is that it takes such a long time to write. <laughs> No, it, that's, that's no joke. That is absolutely... Uh, any composer and, will tell you that. Uh, and, uh, and it's like painting in slow motion. <laughs> yeah, like very slow motion. What? Yeah. You dip your brush in the thing and you go like that. Marvellous. Mm. I'm twiddling about with stuff and writing this day after day, one thing or another, and the whole question of my inspiration or excitement of doing it mm -hmm. was long gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was three weeks ago. And you're talking about moving across the desert. That's what mm -hmm. I'm doing mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Because like 10 seconds of orchestral music. Yeah. 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 Do you get, it's an unfair question perhaps, but do you get bored in a way? It's very, very, very absorbing work, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there's no, I have no shorthand. I was in Bayreuth recently. Have you seen, seen um, Wagner's sketches to the, to the thing? The, uh, well, the ring and stuff. Yeah, the opening of the at Rheingold. You oh, could really? just see that he did it like that. Mm. Yeah, he really did. I mean, he's, he wasn't biting his tongue and two weeks later. Yeah, uh, it's all there. Uh, did you ever... So you don't... As you say, you don't have a shorthand. No. No, I don't have a shorthand. I'll tell you what it's like listening. It's like... It's like driving in a car with the headlights and you've got the bit you can see. Uh, um, is uh, what's immediately in front of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah? Yeah. And if you could take a picture of it, 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 mm -hmm. it, it you could then show it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or that, but you couldn't... Um, it, it's... it's uh, I sort of feel that that's really one of the problems. Because mm. it's so removed from the time it takes to yeah. play. Yeah, yeah. You know? But when he says that those pieces, Versus for Ensembles, Silbriere, Secret Theatre, he feels w that there was a preoccupation with something like game, R roots. Rules. Sorry, R rules. Rules, excuse me. I can't hear. Um, d d you're saying, has that changed? Well, it's a very simple substructure, that. And um, uh, I mean, I have to come back to the beginning. We start a whole new discussion uh, uh, thing about the whole question of bridge passages and moving to to the to the and whether they are um, uh, it's that sort of formalism and the idea of that the players play a music which only belongs to a particular geographical 
place on the stage and uh, um, but I, I I like to think that maybe that that is still there but it, it, it's it's become it has become broken and more fragmented and that you, you it's it's like something which is uh, uh, which needs to be like a sort of jigsaw puzzle that is needs putting that needs it's as if I start in those pieces as if I started with the jigsaw puzzle that finished now my jigsaw puzzle is I'm throwing the pieces out I sort of end up in a sort of in a sort of chaos something like that there was a period where your music had certain different pieces had the common starting point or end point. I mean, the note E was, was one thing, and then there were some pieces that ended or began with D and F for a while. Th that also seems to have D gone... D and F is everywhere. Oh, is that still oh, everywhere? Oh, yes, D and F. It, it, no, I, no, no, E, it, it, I used that because it was the middle of the piano. Right. And it, it seemed to be the most obvious... Mm -hmm. And it was the one thing I didn't have to think about. As where to start, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, but, you know, there, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So come back to the metaphor of the, of the, uh, the picture. And uh, when you're confronted with a, a decision where you make the first mark, on a canvas. Um, where's the choice? Uh, do you put it in, put it in the middle, or do you think? And then, but the choice is you've decided sort of about that, how big the screen is going to be. Uh, so within the context of that, you have to you have to decide where you put it. And the first the first mark you make. Everything then is in relation to it. That's the beginning of the journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So consequently, I did it. I did that because for that simple reason. Mm -hmm. and there's another reason which I'm not going to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> um, a photographer friend of mine, Malcolm Crowthers, uh, took a wonderful photograph of you with masks from the Oristia. Oh, yes and with you next to them. Yeah. And you just signed it with that note, with the note E. Oh, you really? You, yes, you didn't. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Which suggests there was something personal going on there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I became, in, in, it, it, I became interested in ritual because I didn't even know what a ritual was. And somebody told me at one point that my pieces were rituals. <laughs> and I thought, oh, in, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, well we, I invent rituals, of daily rituals. I have a, very, a daily ritual for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, do you want to know I think it? many people do, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 yeah, no, no, but it's very formal. It's very Japanese. It's become right, very right, Japanese. Right, 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 right. And, that, um, and I, I, I look for devices in order to, that you can take the top off an egg. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. cleanly, cleanly done. I've been failing my whole life to do that. What? <laughs> I've been failing my whole life I'll to do that. I'll get you one. Yeah, I want, I want I'll one. I'll get you one. <laughs> <laughs> and is, is, is for, uh, again, I think that recently formal, formal ritual is less f uh, important for your music than it was. Yeah. Well... A piece like the piece you wrote for Deep Time, I mean. Yeah seems to me to be not ritualistic in that kind of way at all. Yeah, you know, I like to think that it, it's as if I'd, if I'd got the form scheme mm -hmm. and written it mm -hmm. and then sort of squashed it. I want it to have that quality mm -hmm. of something that's in a, in, in, in a state of explosion. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Chunks of stuff mm -hmm. um, that if you, if you found the way back, mm -hmm. you... you, uh, you it, you'd end up with something more formal and more mm -hmm. obviously ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.